So we were explaining some concepts of how to plot functions of several variables. Um, basically, we stopped by defining the XYZ 3D space. And after that, uh, we will do some practical examples of functions of uh, two variables about the plots, uh, concepts of level curves, and et cetera, et cetera. So, well, okay. Yeah. I remember that last thing I did. Let me just charge a little bit the camera. So just to give you an idea on how you would manage to plot a point in the 3D space. Well, basically the XY plane is a horizontal plane. And then you have a vertical variable C which is perpendicular to this plane. So you will start by drawing something like this. So we're basically on functions of several variables. So this is the xy plane. You can continue the x-axis over here. So that is horizontal. And then you will have a vertical coordinate, which is going to be called c. And that is the height, essentially. Okay? So you have points x, y, c. And let's say that you have the point 1, 2, 4. Right? So, so far you might be used to plot points in the plane. And you perhaps would know that, okay, this point 1, 2. Right? So this is the x-axis. This is 1 in the x-axis. This is 2 in the y-axis. So in terms of what is the projection in the horizontal plane, this is the point 1, 2, 0, right? So the only thing I need to add is basically a height of 4 to have this point. So 1, 2, 3, 4. I have this. So this would be the point 1, 2, 4. And if you draw basically a perpendicular passing through the z-axis that goes over this point, this would be perpendicular. But you're kind of already familiar with this, so this would be the coordinate one. This would be the coordinate two. This one, one is in the x-axis, two in the y-axis. This is the projection in the xy plane, one, two, zero, and this is the point one, two, four. Likewise, you could do some examples. For example, if you consider the point two minus one comma three, have a coordinate of x equal to two, then you have a minus one, the y-axis. So the point, okay, two in x minus one, this is the projection, two minus one, zero. And then you have a height, actually, sorry, minus three. Um, so you have to decrease the height for three coordinates. So this would be the point two minus one minus three. And if you continue the z-axis, minus one, minus two, minus three, you could draw the perpendicular passing through. So this is the point with C minus three over the C axis. So this is the projection in the XY plane. Basically we have extended the plane to the space by adding a vertical coordinate, which is perpendicular to the XY plane. We will take C as the height or the depth according uh, to the fact that it's positive or negative in the first point. C is equal to 4, which is positive, in the second it is minus 3, which is negative. And you have this possible representation in 3D space. Um, of course, you're learning the basics. Eventually, well, once you graduate here, most probably you're going to use a computer code that generates this kind of figure. But you have to learn the basic steps and then how, to do, how you can do it by yourself on a piece of paper, and then you can do the code. That will be later in the future. But look. Again, don't forget, this is just basically a first year course. Eventually, you will go into the job market. You will have to try good skills for the job market, which are math skills and computational skills. So that's just my suggestion. It's not 
uh, non interesting topic, it might prove very useful later on. So the idea is that you will describe the location of a point in a 3D space. And then in order, so this is the 3D space in order to write the points. We have discussed about the theory before. And if we want to graph a function of two variables, f of x, y, where we know that the variables are independent, So we will use the letter C and we will write C equal to f of x, y. I mean, essentially, think of any function of interest in your discipline that doesn't depend only on a single variable or in two. By plotting that function, which will generate a surface in the 3D space, we'll have precisely a surface defined by C equal to f of x, y. In the domain of interest, in the plane x, y, you will have a value, f of x, y, and that will give you a point in the surface. And you will do that for all points in the domain. Um, so, what you will have is that pairs, ordered pairs, x, comma, y, live in the domain of f. Again, they are points in the x, y plane. And f assigns a height z, or z, that's the Canadian convention, to each point, which would be a depth if z was negative. And for example, again, if we had that f of 1, 2, so the pair is xy, and f of 1, 2 is equal to 4, then what you would do is to plot the point 1, 2, comma 4 in the 3D space, which is what we did before, right? If you remember, we had the order for x, y in the coordinates, x, y equal to 1, 2. That is the plot in the plane for this point, and then you assign the height 4 that is over here, over here, okay? And you have a point in 3D space. And the idea is that you will do that for every point in the domain which belongs to the plane. And that's how you will generate the surface. So again, the graph will be a surface z equal to f of x, y in the 3D space. That for you is intuitively very clear because in terms of the spatial domain we live in 3D, at least in the way the brain interprets the information, right? So you're familiar with that. Um, if you see a cathedral or a duomo, I mean, you will see that it describes a surface, right? So you have the base and then you have the height and then you have the generated surface that you make in your mind. So the idea is that by that same procedure, Let's assume for the moment that the domain of our function is the whole plane, R2. So for any point in the plane, x, y, 0, again, this is important, might not be so mentioned in the book, but there is a convention. This is the x-axis, this is the y-axis, and this is the z-axis. First of all, because x, y is taken a horizontal. Second, because there is an order of rotation. You cannot point the z-axis down if x and y are in that way. If you go into physics, you will see why. Basically, you have a triplet pair, and there are rules of, uh, well, of the right hand, uh, et cetera, et cetera, for electromagnetism, but this is the convention. First x, first y, first z. And given this point, let's say that you make a plot in the 3D space of x, y, and z, which is equal to f of x, y. So for each point in the domain, which we're assuming that it's the plane in this case, like the whole R2, you would do that for each point, and what you would generate is precisely a surface, right? So let's imagine that I have done that for every point. 
that will describe a surface in the space. I'm assuming, of course, that the domain, like all possible values x, y are acceptable, meaning that the domain of the function is the whole plane x, y. I assign by means of that rule. I do it for each point in the plane. I have the surface. We have different kinds of surfaces. We will see some examples later on in the class. But conceptually, that's what we're doing. And this would be the graph of the surface z equal to f of x, y. And there are some examples um, that I will show in a second. Um, on a figure in the book. On the page 535. I'm going to show an older edition, so I mean, maybe the page will not be exactly the same, but it's the same question. Well, so this is just basically a printed book description of what we did. This is the coordinate 1 to 0. Then you go 1 to 4 by this rule. Then you have 2 minus 1, 0, 2 minus 1, minus 3. So this is just a pretty picture. This is the plot of the surface, as you see, for each point in the domain, which in this case we assume is the plane. We assign a third coordinate set, which is the height. We plot in 3D space. And doing that for every point in the plane, we will have a generated surface. That is clear. Now, this is the important part. And look, the topic is very graphic. You guys are. At least, you are students of the 21st century. So, of course, there are different ways, especially for math people, one could think in terms of algebra, in terms of geometry, etc. But now, with the pervasive, uh, the per the pervasive way com computers uh, abound, I think it's more natural to just show the plot. So, the first one is a cone. Everybody has seen a cone in their life. I will make a brief description in a second. The second one is a paraboloid. If you see the form z equal to x squared plus y squared, this is an ellipsoid. You have different lengths of, basically you have, for extension, you have in the formula of the ellipse, and then you can generate the ellipses by this equation. And the fourth one is a saddle. If you have mounted a horse in your life, you have seen how a saddle looks like. If you try to think how it looks, well, in a way you have the parabolas over here, which are going up, and in this direction, the parabolas are going down. Those are different cuts because basically if you make a cut of this surface with the zy axis, the parabola is going up. If you make a cut with the, uh, sorry, with the zy zx plane, the parabolas are going down. And that's how you generate them. In fact, if you look at the formula, it's z equal to y squared minus x squared. So in order to imagine those cuts, let's make, for example, let's say that you are in the yz plane, right? So you would make x equal to z, for example. And then you have z equal to y squared, which is the parabola going up. If you have the plot of this in the, say, xz plane, you make y equal to 0. So z is equal to minus x squared, and the parabola is going down. Now, that is just to make you understand that it's made of parabolas going up and down in different directions. How do you obtain the cone? Again, the same technique. Imagine that for the moment you focus, let's say, on the yz plane, and you make x equal to 0. With x equal to 0 and z equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared, that is the square root of y squared, which is the absolute value of y. And what you would have is a cone in the 1D, the same as we have seen, like the absolute value function, for example. In the paraboloid, again, the same technique. Let's make x equal to 0. You have z equal to y squared, which is a parabola. Now, what is the relation? If you think about it, in the plane, x squared plus y squared is the norm squared of the vector x, y. So what you're doing to generate the first two figures is basically rotate. Let's say that you have the plot of the figure in the 2D plane, in the yz plane. What you will do is basically a rotation around the z-axis in order to generate the figure. And that's how, from the absolute value plot, you get the cone. Just imagine how you rotate. In the other one, it's exactly the same. You have a parabola in the yz uh, plane. You rotate, and you generate this paraboloid cone. Those are techniques, and that is called a surface of revolution. Okay, we will see later on how you can obtain that. But geometrically, just think that I have the plot of the figure in 2D, I make a rotation, which is like how to generate a surface of revolution, and then I obtain the figure in 3D. That is the whole technique. Of course, you need to have a symmetry, which is essentially that you need to have a function 
which is a function of x squared plus y squared. Because that's the only way that you get the norm of the vector and you can obtain it by rotation. In any case, I hope this is a little bit more interesting by showing the plot. We'll show some others later on. Um, just let me go back to the doc cam. Okay. So this is done. Right, I already showed it. Um, we'll go into details. I mean, later on we will actually define what is the surface of revolution, but I want to first motivate the topic, make it interesting, and then we will continue. So, there is a second concept which is called the level curve. And the level curves are curves resulting from the intersection of the surface set equal fxy with z equal to c, where c is a constant, okay? Now, if you think about it, what is z equal to c? This is basically a horizontal plane that is parallel to the xy plane and the height is c. Yeah, right? I mean, what this is telling you, imagine. Now the 3D space is out of its point, and what you're saying, okay, Let's think of the plane where all the points have a set equal to c, which means that they have a height equal to c. Which they have a constant height. With c equal to zero, we know what it, that is. It's the xy plane. If I just increase by height c or decrease by a depth c, I will get the plane which is parallel to the xy plane, but it's still horizontal. So what I'm going to do is basically an intersection. Imagine it. I have the surface, and then I do a cut. I do a cut with a plane of height c, and I see what we get, right? But if you imagine you have a surface, you make a cut with a plane, you will probably get a curve. And that will be the level curve. So what you're doing is basically intersecting, well, f of x, y is equal to z, which is the definition of the surface, but it's intersecting with the plane, which is such that z is equal to c. So that means that it's a set of points, x comma y, such that f of x, y, equal to c. And if you think about it, let's think the simplest case that you could actually like kind of pass all the terms related to x. Well, this is implicitly defining a curve. If you're lucky enough to have this on the form y equal to a g of x and also of the constant, you will have a function y in terms of x. So you can imagine that the curve is actually describing a function in the plane. So the name for this though This is called the level curve of f at c. Okay? So it's the level curve of the function at c, meaning that it has the constant height c, and you're doing an intersection. Um, the plot might be more useful, and so that's why we will do a plot. But first, okay. But we will have, this was too small, okay, we have the level curve of f at c. But actually c is a parameter that you can change, right? I mean, you can increase your plane and you might obtain a different curve. So you, what you actually have is a family of level curves where c varies over a set of numbers. Of course it depends, I mean, you cannot, or not all the planes will give you an intersection. Let's imagine, for example, the cone. The cone only has points for which the height is non-negative, because x squared plus y squared is greater or equal to zero. If you cross with a plane, say z equal to minus one, it will not intersect with the cone. So that's why it's basically, loosely speaking, c varies over our set numbers, meaning on the range of the function. But again, the plot might be more descriptive. Let's say that, well, I'm gonna draw this by parts, but 
I will do first an intersection drawing the plane z equal to c. I'm going to imagine that this is the intersection and then I'm going to draw the surface plane just once. Imagine that I have this surface z equal to f of x, y, so this kind of like little mountain, and then I crossed a plane of height c, which is a horizontal plane, and what I obtain, if I cross this mountain with the plane, I get an intersection, which is being my level curve. That will be the set of points such that f of x, y is equal to c. So that is the definition of that curve of intersection, okay? I'm curious. Can you imagine? Uh, can you imagine this geometrically, like in your mind? I mean, you guys are more visual for sure because, well, you are from a different generation than me, and that means that you have basically you use the computer and your mobile in a more frequent basis in general, or you have used it. So. Well, you're used to gaming, you're used to YouTube videos, etc. It's way clearer that you have that geometric imagination more than the algebraic. Okay? So just try to imagine. I draw the mountain, I cross the plane, I have the curve. I think since you guys are more used to basically uh, geometrical intuition, it's more um, convenient for you to see it that way. And then what you have here is the level curve of F at C which is precisely what we said, right? We made an intersection of the surface, which is this mountain. Can you imagine the mountain? Yeah. With the plane, which gives me that curve, which is the level curve of f of c. And, well, actually, since you're Canadian, that makes sense. Who here has gone hiking to a mountain or something? Right. Do you see at the entrance of the hiking park or whatever that you have a map of the topography of the mountain? It's precisely that. Basically, in that map, what you see, okay, somebody make a picture, makes a picture from a bow, and it's indicating the hike over that plane, right? So if you go closer to basically the center, like of the mountain, the height increases. And what you have are level sets, essentially, where the value of the height, which is set in that case, goes higher. So I will show a picture in one second, but this is the same idea. of a topographical map used when hiking a mountain. So, to give a little bit of um, some intuition, of course, I'm never going to make with my hand a picture better than this. So, I just want to give some uh, intuition into what falls, right? Let's imagine that is the mountain. You start here, and you see the map at the end, right? What you're doing is cuts with planes of bigger height, you increase the height. First, let's say this is in, I don't know, meters, right? And what you have is the topography. You're doing an intersection of the mountain, which is constant plane of height z equal to 100, 300, 1,000, 1,500. That is the way that you would look at the contour plane, right? So, the level surfaces that are appearing by the intersections of the different planes, let's say 100, 300, 1,000, 1,500, of course you are getting higher as you go down to the center of the mountain, they are different level sets. But it's the same kind of map that you would see when you go hiking in a park. So this concept is not new. I mean, what perhaps the course is trying to do is to get you to formalize some intuition that you have from before from everyday life, especially with plots in 3D space. Because at the end of the day, especially, our brain is made us to, or has made us to interpret things as living in a 3D space. And for us speaking, we live in a 4D because in addition to the space, we have the time, right? So that is where we live, and this is very intuitive to you. Um, so what we will do now is to work an example where we discuss the concept of level sets. So, okay. the example 7.1.8 is to discuss the level curves of the function of 
of x y equal to x squared plus y squared. You can already show the plot of that. It's a paraboloid. Moreover, if you see, you have this dependence on x squared plus y squared, which is the norm of the vector x y. Um, if you think about the solution of this, well, you have f of x y equal to c, so that is the level curve of f at c. So it's a set of points in the surface which intersect the plane. So surface f of x y equal to the height of the plane C. Having that equality, what you have is that x squared plus y squared is equal to C. So, now, well, what is this equation looking like? What is this? Well, it's a circle, right? Okay. Now, the second thing is that you have to make an observation, which is that x squared plus y squared is always greater or equal to zero. The lowest it can be is zero, right? There is no point for which a sum of the squares can be negative. That we know. That is by definition of the norm. So that means that only, well, you can only, or the only intersection will happen for values of c which are greater or equal to zero, okay? So basically, only c greater or equal to zero will give you intersection. So, again, the justification. There are no points that satisfy x squared plus y squared equal to c if c is negative. There is none. So now with having known what is C, which is either a zero or a positive value, we explore the possibilities, right? For C equal to zero, that would mean that X squared plus Y squared is equal to zero. Now, which points can satisfy that? There is actually only one point which can satisfy it, which is the origin, right? Because look, well, there are many reasons for that, but the only, point that satisfies that is the point x, y, such that x and y is zero, zero. First of all, a square number is non-negative, that you know. If you have a real number, like if x is real and y is real, whatever positive or negative, x squared is either positive or zero. So the sum has to be positive or zero, and the only way you can obtain the series actually if both are zero. If you have one of them, such that is not zero, the squared will be positive, and then that won't be equal to zero. So that's basically why you use uh, this as definition of a norm. So the second one, let's say that you consider the set of points such that, since we know that c can only be either positive or zero, and we explore the case equal to zero, what happens if it's positive, right? So, okay, this makes sense, this is a circle, and we can put it actually in a nicer form, which is the square root of c squared, right? Do you guys see why I did that, just to make it nice? Because that will be r squared, so that is the radius of the circle that is defined, and the radius is the square root of c. Okay, I just put it in a nice fashion so that you understand. I mean, up to that point, it's clear that that is a circle, centered around the origin that makes evident that the radius of that circle is the square root of c. Um, so what you have in this case is a circle of radius square root of c centered at the origin, which is zero, zero. If you don't remember this, I would suggest you there's a page given at the beginning of the course where you have to explore like this um, families of functions that you should be familiar with, like a circle, line, ellipsoid, or sorry, ellipse, parabola, hyperbola, etc., etc. That is gonna come in handy because actually what we're gonna study is, well, sometimes rotations of those 2D plots that generate a 3D surface. So it would be convenient for you if you forgot. So the surface, if you think about it, is z equal f of x, y equal to x squared plus y squared. But we have our level curves, z 
equal to x squared plus y squared, which is greater or equal to zero by definition of the norm. Um, those would be, well, the level curves are basically cross sections. of the surface, perpendicular to the z-axis, meaning that, okay, the z-axis is perpendicular to the plane, so it's a cross at the height c. Now, there's a name for this, and this is where we go back to these um, surfaces of revolution. So, the name for this surface is actually called a paraboloid of revolution also called circular paraboloid, precisely because, again, if you think about it, well, maybe this is an easier way to illustrate. This is z equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared squared, right? I just, okay, put the square root, but then the squared, so it's the same that I wrote before. So if you think about it, let's say that you are in the 2D plane where x is equal to zero to the yz plane, right? You make x equal to zero, then you have, well, basically z equal to y squared. So the reason I wrote it that way is because when you rotate, let's say that you have that 2D plot, you rotate around the z axis, it's basically a transformation where you go from, let's say, y or x to the square root of x squared plus y squared. But that's precisely like if you do that, Basically, instead you were restricted in a plane, and by that transformation, let's say going from x to square root of x squared plus y squared, it's basically extending the definition of that function to all the points with the same radius in the plane. That's why it's called a surface of revolution. So hopefully that makes it a little bit clear. In fact, if we draw the level sets, well, there are many things we can do, um, but. Um, Of course, the level sets are circles. I'm going to start drawing circles around the origin, as we found. Okay, something like this. Well, it's not a perfect circle, but I try. So this is x, this is y. If I check basically the radius, okay, this is radius one, radius two, radius three. But since we know that the square root of c is the radius, what you would have is that this is the one corresponding to c equal to one, this one to z equal to four, and the third one to c equal to nine. So that when you take the square root, you get one, two, three, okay? So those are the level curves, which are circles around the origin with the um, for uh, the value of c, the radius is the square root of c. And later on, I'm going to plot this surface, right? So here, I will try to basically do what I have been saying over and over. Let's say that we restrict to the yc plane, okay? So I would have this parabola. I mean, if you think about it, Basically, I would have the form z equal to x squared plus y squared. And now think about this for a second. For the points of the form x comma zero, that means that z is equal to x squared, right? I'm just working with this surface of revolution and then just choosing a special point. For the points of the form zero comma y, what I get is that this is of the form z equal to y squared, right? So far, so good for everybody. Now, why am I bothering to do this? Because I'm making obvious that if you consider just the intersections basically now of the surface, but with either the plane yz or the plane xz or zx if you want, what I get are parabolas. Now, if I focus on this one, for example, where x is equal to zero, in that plane yz, I would get this parabola. Right, z equal to y squared, so wait for me one second. And I would get this. This is just the picture. 
right? In this plane, y is set, basically for this point. This is y and z plane. Now, what do I do in order to generate it? Because mathematically what happens is that there is a symmetry, which is why I wrote this. There is a symmetry where x squared plus y squared is appearing, which means that there is a symmetry in terms of doing the surface of revolution, like by rotation, to generate or pass from 2D to 3D. And that is what I will do. If I basically do the rotation around the z-axis, what I would get would be something like this, okay? So of course, if I consider now the intersection with the xz plane of this surface, I will have the other parabola in that other plane. But it's clear, right? I start with the plot in 2D, I rotate around the z-axis, like I have a machine to make that rotation, I get the surface of revolution, which is this paraboloid z equal to x squared plus y squared. And it's mainly because you have this symmetry. Okay, when you have functions of the form x squared plus y squared, that is equal to the radius squared, which means that there is a symmetry of rotation. That is the trick, okay? Just to give you an idea of when that will happen and when it will not happen. So, to give the concept, essentially, do a revolution, meaning like this rotation around the axis. So you rotate the 2D plot around the Z axis. And if you want to write it more in a mathy term, what you do is that you pass from the X variable to the R variable, which is equal to the square root of X squared plus Y squared, which is basically points that uh, were once in the X axis now belong to the circle in the XY plane, which have the same distance to the origin. That is what a rotation is like. So I think mathematically it's kind of clear how to generate these surfaces of revolution. That's why the name of this surface is paraboloid of revolution. We make this rotation around this axis, just imagine in your mind to do that rotation. And that would exhaust our object, which has some symmetries, mainly that surface of revolution. Now, we have done some um, math exercises, but the interesting part for you perhaps is to go to the application. And we will present a couple examples that appear in economics. So, little curves in economics. Basically, you have functions of the form q of x, y equal to c, where q. Can you repeat that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So q is the output of a production process, and the pair x, y usually represents some variables such as hours of labor. and capital investment. So it's basically, well, something more general than the function that we studied last time, right? Which uh, was this law of exponents with different exponents such that the sum was one. So there's one example. There is a name for this. Um, this is called the curve of constant product, sorry, product. C, and this is also called an isoquant, meaning the same quantity, iso equal, quant quantity. So Can you remember? Sure. You're welcome. So, well, just remember the example that we saw last time, right? We had this productivity in terms of those two variables. This is a function of two variables. So basically, you're studying, again, in this possible parameter space. The set of points, or the possible combinations of hours of labor and capital investment, such that the output is the same. That actually makes sense in terms of what to study, right? If you're a company, maybe it's more convenient to make a different choice of X and Y's, but yet the output would be the same. That would be a good solution, if perhaps you're limited in one of the quantities, either X and Y. The second example is something called indifference curve where x is related to the units of a first commodity and 
and you have a second commodity as well. You are ready. You do not see yet what will be the dependent variable. The dependent variable will be something called the utility function, which we're going to call u, which is a function of x and y, of the units of this first commodity. And this is basically a measure of the satisfaction of the consumer. Now, what you can have are basically level curves of the form u of x, y equal to z. And this is called the indifference curve. The name makes sense because if u is basically a measure of the satisfaction of the customer, these are all the possible combinations of the first and the second commodity such that the satisfaction is the same, right? So you can change, if you are in that level curve, you can change or choose a different pair x and y, but as long as they're in the level curve, the value of the function will be the same. So basically the name comes because uh, it's all the points have in that level curve have the same level of satisfaction for the customer. So we will do one last problem, which goes as this. The utility derived by a consumer from X units of one commodity and Y units of a second commodity or a second one is given by the form or the function U of XY equal to x to the three halves times y. We're just given this. If the consumer currently owns x equals 16 units of the first one, of the first commodity, and y equal 20 units of the second commodity, find from the current level of utility and a sketch the respective indifference curve. Remember that the indifference curve is the level set of this function. So we go straight to find the value of C, essentially. So if I plot, or if I compute U for X equal to 16, Y equal to 20, and if I use this rule, let me find C, so you have 16 to the 3 halves multiplied by y equal to 20. So 16 is 4 squared to the 3 halves multiplied by 20. So I take the square root. Then you have 4 cubed multiplied by 20. But this is 16 times 4, which is 64 times 20. So this is sorry, 12 8. So Okay, we did the computation. What would be the indifference curve, which is the level set? Would be the function u of x, y equal, well, on one hand you have x to the three halves times y. On the other hand, because it's a level curve associated with this, this is 1280. So you can, or you're lucky enough in this case to actually pass x to the other side and you have y equal to 1280 times x to minus 3 halves, right? 
If you want to put it in a nicer fashion, actually we'll do it when we explore. Well, basically this is the curve for the value of C equal to 1280. If I consider in general different level curves, what I have is C equal to x3 halves y, which means that y is equal to C x minus 3 halves. And if I want to put it in a nicer fashion, well, you have basically square root of x and cubed. Right? Just that you, well, x to the one half, so the minus accounts for the denominator, then the one half means for the square root, then you have the cube. So for the particular case of c equal to 1280, it's basically the set of points such that u of x, y is equal to 1280 that we figured out before. And the reason we put this uh, function in terms of a power law is because now it will be more intuitive what we get when we plot it, right? So this is x and y. Basically, there is an inverse relation in terms of a power of x. If you allow me, let me just quickly draw this. Something like this, since there is an inverse relation. Of course, one of the points, it's not at scale, but you would be in the point 16 to 20, for example, in this one. So you have the coordinate 16 over here, 20 over here. This is the curve x cubed times y equal to 1280, which is the c in this case. So of course, you can have different curves, which, well, we have the inverse relation. Of course, they plot for x equal to 0, etc., etc. Not in detail, but basically, this would be for a value of c that is less than 1280. This would be for a c greater than 1280. So these are different plots, and this is basically the just a sample of indifference curves for u of x y equal to x to the three halves times y, where of course x to the three halves times y is equal to a constant. Now. Um, a couple comments before we finish. So of course the textbook is going to have nicer pictures in this particular exercise. So this would be the actual solution, right? So this is x cubed, well, x to the 3 halves times y equal to 1280. These are the different little sets. This would be, just don't make noise if you leave, you know? Just in, I haven't finished, so go if you want, just don't make noise. So this is basically for the surface of revolution, set x squared plus y squared, like the different level sets. Of course, this is the form of the paraboloid. They're doing different intersections. The intersection is the circle. And again, this notion that in one of the planes you have the parabolas and in the other you have a different set of parabolas. Now, my last comment is precisely because you're a millennial and you're more useful to the computer and to internet tools. If you were to do this professionally, you would use a software such as MATLAB, etc., etc. If you're a student at this point, of course, you have a free resource of the internet, which is Wolfram Alpha, which is basically the internet version of Mathematica, so I'm pretty sure that you know it. Let's say that I make, to make the choice of plotting this function z equal to x squared plus y squared, right? So what you have is this paraboloid form. It generates the figure. If I look at the contour, this is basically doing the same thing that I showed in the previous plot. So the locus of the level sets, of course, are the circles. It's making a mesh, um, well, in addition to the mesh, it's making basically a color plot in terms of which value is higher for the paraboloid. If you were to do this in a real job, actually, you would probably use something more evolved like Python or MATLAB or Julia. Actually, my suggestion is that you get as soon as possible or as soon as you can into coding because that's a pretty useful skill if you want to do an internship or get a job. Um, especially for quants, there's recently a programming language called Julia, which is basically the best of both worlds, which is as simple to use as MATLAB or Python and as powerful if you were to use C++. Uh, if you go for the people who are quantitative analysts who work as quants, say New York, Chicago, whatever, that is a pretty um, hot language recently, and there have been many conferences. 
So I would really recommend you that you check into that. But in any case, I mean, this is related to a real life skill. I hope you enjoy the topic and best of luck when you start. I was looking at back over the 